There are lots of exciting things going on. I know Joshua or Joel gave you lots of announcements today about some of the things that are happening. I'm especially excited about the Wednesday when we're able to learn some new songs and be able to sing together and uh, learn how to do that. And so that's great. I know Joshua's got a great thing set up for the family challenge out here. Just one note on the family challenge that I heard that is not in place of church, okay? So just make sure you know that when it's, you know, at home, that doesn't mean stay home on Sunday morning, all right? So it is to increase and allow you to be able to take your family to a whole new level in their service and in their worship to God. So we've talked about a couple of lessons already. One is about the uh, increase and the fact that we do have a God of increase. He gives. He's the one who wants more. But a lot of times we get the more mixed up. And we think God wants me to have more for myself so I can spend on me. And that's not quite true. He wants you to have more life. More abundance of living. More that fills your life. And then we talked about it goes from increase to abundance. And it's this idea that... You know, God has made us fruitful and that everything we do and the things that we are able to accomplish and and work toward, all of those work out. It's amazing how those things go. I mean, God is able to bless our efforts, able to allow us to be able to see great things and able to allow us to uh, find this abundance. He gives this abundance, not in stuff but in abundance of living and this fruitfulness. Paul talked about the secret, and he says, the secret is I've learned I can be happy wherever I am. Doesn't matter how much I have, I have learned to be content. I know we get a lot of people who complain to us, right? Not that we ever would, but we get a lot of other people who complain about their life, and, and you know, everything is awful, everything is... Well, not everything. You can always find somebody worse off that makes you feel good about your life. And so we should be able to rejoice. There are always worse circumstances. It's just a matter of where you find yourself and you're able to live this fulfilled life no matter what the circumstances are. So today we want to talk about going from small to great, and maybe this is something that you already understand and that you already know, but just we're going to run through several things that talk about this concept today. So in Matthew 13, the idea is two parables that Jesus tells. It says, he put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it had grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make their nest in its branches. And he told another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Okay, very simple parables. He talks about this seed, this mustard seed. I don't know if you've seen a mustard seed. Sometimes I've even seen women with a necklace that has a tiny, tiny grain of a mustard seed. It's very, very small. And yet when you plant it and it's allowed to grow, has the proper nourishment and water and all of that, it grows into a huge tree. It's bigger than anything else in the garden. So it starts from a very small point And that's what Jesus is trying to say. I want you to understand, this is how God works. He starts from small, and he goes to big. See, if you got that, you already got the lesson. And that's what he talks about, is this idea of starting from small and going to big. Uh, The second is the idea of leaven. The bread that was just passed around does not look like this. It doesn't have holes in it. In fact, it's only that big. It uh, is unleavened bread. 
But have you ever seen bread work? Have you ever made bread at home, seen someone who's doing this? You, you put the yeast in or the starter in, and then you let it set. You know, you don't fluff it, throw it up in the air, try and blow more air into it somehow. No, you just let it set. Let it work, and it does its stuff, and it makes all the holes. It makes the bread, and it makes it nice and soft and fluffy, and so that's what we want to be able to use. He says the kingdom of heaven is like these two things. So this kingdom of heaven is like something that starts so very, very small and grows to something that's large. The same way leaven, no matter what you do, when you put it in, it's going to work. You can't stop it. You can't reach back in and pull it out. It's already started to be infused in with all of this. It's become part of all of this. And so it is going to be part of that. And a little leaven does the whole thing. It keeps going because it turns it all into that. Now, sometimes that has a bad meaning. And if you look at some passages in the Bible, it talks about this idea of, you know, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees because it can work for good or for bad. And, of course, Jesus here is saying if you take a little bit of leaven for good and use God and use God's commands and use the things in the power of God, he says he produces great things in your life. But the warning is also there. If you take a little bit of evil and put that in your life, it can produce a huge amount of horrible things. So the choice is ours. Which one do we want? Which one are we going to do? Both of these are based off of this one idea of the kingdom of heaven. So what is the kingdom of heaven? What does that really mean? A lot of times people will say, well, that means we're all going to go to heaven and God will be king. Partly true, but it starts long before that. Jesus came here to establish his kingdom. He talked with Pilate about his kingdom. And it's not really set up until after he ascends into heaven, but once he does that, he has the power to establish the kingdom of heaven here on earth, all of his teaching about the kingdom of heaven and, and what kingdom people are like was not for when you get to heaven. It was for here. It's for now. And that's what he expects of all those people who are to be part of this kingdom of heaven. Uh, it's the people who take God as king. They make themselves subject to him. They obey him. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's not a physical one. It is people who are dedicated to God. And today, the easiest place to see that is right here. It's in church. Because that's where you're going to find people who are dedicated to God. It's not the church building. Please don't misunderstand that. It's not every building that you run to that has the name church over it. But it is those people who truly follow and serve God. And you must be part of this kingdom to get the abundance that's what he talks about. That's what he says. The kingdom of heaven is like the guy who gets abundance. The kingdom of heaven is like the one who has the leaven, and it leavens the whole thing. And so make sure you understand what he's trying to say. It is part of being part of this spiritual family of God. Early on, it was Israel as the kingdom of God, but now it's a spiritual kingdom, and Jesus is in charge of it. And we see that very much today. How do we get this kind of abundance? So church is like when man plants a seed in his life. And then it grows. It doesn't look good at first. It's not impressive at first. It's not even something that you're going to say, wow, that's great, that's exciting. It's, it's more like the leaven. It's, you didn't even notice it. But he starts with, I believe in God. And he starts with, I'm going to read my Bible. And he starts with, I know that this is going to make a difference in my life. And he's planted God in his life first. And then it begins to influence not only the way he acts, but the way he talks. And then it influences all kinds of people around him. And it influences the way in which 
they react with him and interact with him. And as you look at that, it begins to change his life as he changes other people's lives. And so you're able to see how this concept works, and it grows from a very small beginning into this great big thing that God wants. We have this amazing abundance. And so lots of people plant God in their life. And the growth is because of them being joined together. And we call that church. I saw this. Start small and grow from there. Success rarely works the other way around. You don't always start big and keep it. It does not work that way. You start small. And I want you to understand today that is God's plan. That is what he says. That is the way churches grow. That is the way people grow. There is no other alternative. Please don't think there's another way to do this. Because I think we keep looking for that. How can I be a big church? Okay. That's a fair question. That's a good thing. How do we get to be a big church? But I think we need to understand how all of this works. You see, the natural progression versus the God progression, maybe we need to understand that. If you take evolution and understand how evolution works, they call it survival of the fittest, right? So the strongest lion wins, and he will be in charge of the jungle. The strongest survive. That is not true with us. Because the strongest are the ones who go fight. And they go fight to protect those who are weak so that the weak survive. The ones who survive in the human race are the ones who are protected. It is not the strongest. And maybe if you turn us into animals, then we're nothing more than that. And maybe the strong ones would survive then. But that's where the theory breaks down. It does not work that way. God's theory is, or God's not his theory, but his fact is it goes from small to great. I'm going to take a person who's weak and I can make them great. I'm going to take something that is small and I'm going to make it great. And that's how God is so different. Evolution does not naturally go to make great things. It starts big and says, wow, look at this. This is great. And then it decays. And then it has erosion. And then it, well, it's got to repopulate, right? It is not the same way as what God does. The point is to start with small things, and we see this as a conflict in our world today. I don't know if you watch people who buy houses on TV. There's a whole show dedicated to people who go in and buy this house. And there's this young couple, they're, you know, 23, and they've gone in to buy this house. And it's our first house. We just got married. We're able to start. And we only have $600,000 to spend on our first house. And I say, you poor things. How terrible is that? You've only got 600. And they walk into this huge mansion of a house and say, oh, it's just not big enough. I was hoping I would have a little bit more room. That's our concept today. Kids don't start with, I'm going to start really small, and eventually I'll have what my parents have. No, they start with, I want everything my parents have, and then I want a lot more. But nobody has this idea of starting small. We think we'll accidentally get it or we'll luck into it somehow. I want you to know God does not bless that. That is not his plan. If you win the lottery, that is not his plan. That is not the way God works. I mean, you can win the lottery. Just know that that isn't how God works. He goes from small to great. Okay? So, 
there's a time when Jesus talks about these parables and he talks about what it is that they're going to find. In Matthew 13 also, which is a collection of parables, then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secret of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. So he talks here about secrets of the kingdom of heaven, and what are those secrets? And then he talks about the one who has. The one who has what? There is a person who has, and if you look at what he's trying to describe, it's the person who the person who gets it, the person who understands it, the person who can see what Jesus is saying, the person who not just has a lot of money, but who sees behind the scenes. It's there's a person who has, and he talks to his disciples and says, you are one of the ones who have. They are the ones who would hear a parable and understand what it means for their life and be able to make an application. Because a lot of people can hear the parable and they go, yeah, I don't get it. Doesn't make any sense to me. That's not what gets blessed. There is this concept of the one who has. And Jesus talks about this idea as there are some people who have. And he says, they're the ones who understand. They're the ones who believe. They're the ones who get it. They understand the small. And then they can get bigger. The one who has, has learned to have small. Does that make sense? Not sure I'm saying that right. And then he can progress to something that's big. So illustration might be there's a, you know, a small tree. It looks great. It's doing well. It'll grow. And we don't think about what's going to happen with it. The one who has is the one who understands what small is and takes care of what small is. If you don't feed and water this tree, it doesn't grow. If you don't take care of what's small, you will not have big. I don't know if that's making sense or not, but a lot of times we expect, oh, it'll just grow. Okay, but you have to have something first. You have to have this faith. This tree is going to grow. God starts small when you look at it. It's just the way in which he works. God's plan is to learn what's small and to make it work in your life first. Not to say I don't have enough. Not to say I wish I had more. But to say, okay, I'm going to be happy with what I have. I'm going to learn to live on what I have. And if I can learn to live on what I have, then God can bless with the big. And that's really the concept of what he's describing. And when it gets to be big, it gets to be big. Yeah, that was a redwood. It gets to be really big. But if we do not understand how to take care of small and how to live small, we cannot get to living big. All right? You see it in the way God does everything. When he creates the world, how many people does he start with? Two. Why not two million? You know, that way if something happens, you know, you lose a half million or so, there's still some backup. I mean, that's the way we would think about it. I need to have extra. I need to have enough so I'm not going to run out. He says, no, I want you to learn what small is about. And they start with two people. That's it. That's what creation's about. He starts over again with one family. That's Noah. He says, no, I'm starting again. I'm going to start with one family. And the blessings of all the things that God is doing comes through one family, Abraham. And it goes to his son and to his son and to his son. If Abraham did not know how to live faithful, it would never have gone to his next son and his next son and his next son. 
This is what family challenge is all about. If the family does not learn to work their family and learn to be dedicated to God in their family, it doesn't go to the grandkids and the great-grandkids and the uncles and cousins and nephews and everybody else. It ends right there. We've got to learn how to have the small and how to do well with the small before we can ever go big. Faithful in little and faithful in much. Learning to work with the small is one of those things that's very important. Jesus started with 12 disciples, right? He didn't start with many more than that. I mean, he could have had more than that, but he says, I want disciples. And so the way in which he does that, it is this idea of small that makes all the difference. So a lot of times people will say, well, I think I want to preach. Can I do a sermon? I said, yeah, we've got some place on Sunday night where people are able to, well, no, I didn't want to do that. I want to do Sunday morning. If you can't preach Sunday night, you can't preach Sunday morning. Start small. Let me make it real practical. That's what he's saying. If you can't say a prayer, then why would you get to the preaching? Start small. Be able to do what you can. But we want to jump right in and say, oh, no, I want the big up front thing. It's not all it's cracked up to be, by the way. <laughs> Small investments get the bigger return. That's really what happens. If God increases, then our life will have abundance, then our life will have overflow. It's about using the small amount now. If you don't have a small amount and you feel like you're kind of empty and I don't know what that is, then I want you to question about what you believe. And then I want you to look at the promises of God. And if you look at those promises and those don't do anything, then I want you to just start with prayer. Start small. You can say that and say, God, I don't understand this. And God always answers that prayer. And God always allows the one who is looking to be able to have. And what an incredible thing it is. All right, so we've looked at passages, we looked at parables. What about the miracle? Let's look at the miracle next. Matthew 15, 32 says, When Jesus called his disciples to him and he said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and they have nothing to eat. And I'm unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, Where are we to get enough bread in, how, in such a but desolate place? to feed so great a crowd. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few fish. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, and they took the seven loaves and the fish, and he, having given thanks, he broke them, and he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up the seven baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. Why do this? Well, people are hungry. Now, Jesus never really does it for that reason. It's not just because people are hungry. It's to teach his disciples what this is all about. Can you think with this idea of small to big? And so he says, I, you know, I don't want to send them away. He creates the problem for them. You see, he could have stopped the sermon earlier. Well, no, maybe that's not true. There are some you just can't stop. But he could have not had this situation, but he puts them in the situation. And as he puts them in the situation, he says, you give them something to eat. Well, they, you know, where are we going to get enough for this many? And so the question becomes, enough. And his next one is, how much do you have? Does it matter how much they have? If they'd only had five loaves, would he go, oh, yeah, we don't have enough. It really doesn't matter. He wants them to know and count how much do you have. We have seven. All right, now you know what small is. Now you work from what small is and you make it 
big. And he illustrates that by just saying, all right, now you start handing out. And the fruit of what you do is blessed. Because it keeps going and it goes to the next one. It goes to the next one. It's amazing how all of this works. If you do small things well, it works well. You can see that as they're able to take just a few things. And here they've got to pass out to 4,000 men plus women plus kids. And there's always more women and many more kids than... And so 15, 20,000, that's a lot of lunch to serve and then clean up. You see, he did not want just the numbers. If he had just made lunch every single day... He could have had all kinds of people, right? He could have had a huge number of followers. He wasn't about the number. He said, this goes from small to great. We start with disciples. We want the quality of disciples, and we make disciples into something bigger. And so it wasn't just about people who came and listened. It wasn't just about those things. It is about doing small things well. And that's what he's trying to get across. He's showing his disciples how to do ministry. Take care of the small things first. And so if that principle is true, then God is in the process of making this great. He is in the process of making this a great church. He is in the process of making your life an abundant life. Because you're probably sitting here going, yeah, I'm kind of at the small end of all of this. If you're already sitting here going, I have great abundance, I am so happy for you, that's great. But you may be sitting here, yeah, it's kind of small on my part. We need to allow him to work in our life. So, if you want a big church, how does it happen? I'm going to tell you how it happens, okay? Here's how it happens. They do one thing. All big churches, no matter where, they do one thing. They pay attention to detail. That's it. That's the whole secret. They pay attention to detail, and they do the details extremely well. And when you do the details extremely well, it makes great things. They do small things well. How many of you ever been to Disneyland? Disney World on my side. Why is that so popular? Who's going to say, I want you to come and uh, spend a hundred bucks to get in and stand in line for an hour and a half for a two-minute ride? How many people would do that? Thousands, so much so that I saw just this week, Disney is limiting their unlimited pass. They cannot hold all of the people. Why? What is it that they did? They pay attention to detail. When you go there, all of the paint looks new. All of the bushes are perfect. There is not one blade of grass out of line. If there's a bush that starts to look a little bit wilted, it is replaced before the next day. All of the water is clean. All of the walkways are clean. There is not a single bit of trash anywhere. And there are people following along right behind you in case you drop something. And people will spend a hundred bucks a pop to get in and stand for an hour and a half for a two-minute ride in a place like that. Okay? We see it. When you pay attention to the details and you do the blades of grass, I'm talking small. You understand? When you do quality work with that, people come. People are impressed. 
And it's amazing what they're able to do. And so they just build another land. In Florida, they built a whole world. And you can walk all the way around the world. It's got a big lake in the middle. Why do people go to places like that? I want to see something perfect. I want to sit where they've paid attention to all the detail. And that's what Jesus is saying as well. Not that Jesus invented Disney, but they just stole it from him. Is the people who pay attention to the detail and do the small things well, it has success. It grows. It does big. So what does that have to do with a perfect church? See, people are drawn to excellence. If every single ministry in this church did every single thing they could to do every single thing perfect, it's going to be huge. God blesses people who pay attention to detail. If that's the ministry he gave you, then do it well then do it to perfection, then make it excellent. And the times when you make it excellent, he blesses and he grows. And that's how it happens. The church that does not grow is the one where you come in and, yeah, we'll get it done eventually. You know, we're kind of, we don't worry about things too much. People show up late, they don't really care. Teachers lay, classes are not really all that good because, well, they pick up their Bible that morning and go, oh, well, what should we study about? Let's read this verse. What do you think it means? Well, I think it says what it means. It means what it says, right? Well, let's go on to the next verse. Are you kidding me? And we wonder why no one comes. We have not got the concept that God blesses from small to great. If every single ministry did that, it would be fantastic. And the indictment against us is that maybe we're not doing the small things to the best of our ability. When you put those in, it does do well. It is alive. It is doing great things. So you have the way that the mountain is conquered. Yeah, look at the first little thing. Look at the, there's five steps. You grow, you start, and you go up. And you can climb the whole mountain that way if you take it in just little bits. What an incredible thing it is. So Wednesday we're going to learn a song. We're going to learn it well because we have some teachers who are going to come who are going to be doing a great job in that. But if half of you say, well, you know, we don't really care about the singing. We don't really want to sing well. We don't care what it sounds like. Yeah, you know what happens. It does not get better. So we all want to come to church and say, you know, I want to go to a place that really sounds bad. (laughs) They can't hold a tune in a bucket. I love it there. People don't do that. What I'm saying is pay attention to the detail. We have an opportunity to do some great things. Are we going to? You know, what does Sunday morning sound like? Well, here's how to make it sound and allow God to bless it. It's paying attention to the detail. I know, I've already crossed over the line, gone to meddling in your life by now. But this is how it works, and it's the reason why it doesn't work and the reason why it does work. It's very simple in Scripture. Use the small things. Do the small things that he gives you perfect, and it will be great. 
The last one is the parable of the talents. Jesus tells a parable about a king who is going on a, on a journey and he gives money to three of his servants. To one he gives five, to another two, and to another one according to their ability, right? They have different ability. And you may say, well, I don't know, I just, mine's really small. Great. At least you know you're one of the haves. Because it takes one of the haves to be able to do that, right? And so he has. And the five talent and the two talent, one go and they trade and they get more according to their ability. And he's pleased with them. Enter into the joy of your master. And then he comes down to the one talent guy. He says, he would also receive one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money and put it with the bankers. And at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But to the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we've looked at the group ones, we've looked at all different kinds, and here it comes down to the individual. They're each on their own, they don't interact with each other, they're not part of a group together. This is people who are just there on their own, and God has entrusted them. He has the wrong picture of God. He doesn't understand God at all. He thinks God is the one who cheats. And and there's a lot of times when people will completely misunderstand God and everything about him. And they're just not aware of anything that God's trying to do. And the master comes back and he says, well, you should have at least done better with that. At least put it in the bank and get some interest. But the whole point comes down to one thing. He did not do anything with the small. Unless you do well with the small. And maybe you don't have any ability. God seems not to care about that. Because the guy with only two now has four. And the next go round, he's going to have more than the guy who started with five. That's the way it works. It's what God tells us. He who has is given more. It seems so unfair in this, doesn't it? Give it to the guy who has 10? Are you kidding me? But we do that, right? We have a job that needs to be done. Well, who should we get to do it? Well, you know the principle. Find someone who's busy. You give it to the guy who's busy because you know he's going to do a good job. You don't give it to the guy who has the time. You give it to the guy who's busy. We understand this principle. We're taking it from God. God's giving it to us here. And so the parable is about the same growth of the kingdom. It goes from small to great. There's only one exception or one that we might think is an exception, and that's the church on Pentecost. And we say, yeah, God started with a great church there. No, what you don't understand, he started with a very small church there. He started with only 3,000. I know, that sounds big, doesn't it? Because we completely misunderstand. Because within a few months, it's 5,000. And then 15, and then 20, and then 50. And then it spread all over the world. He started small. But sometimes our idea of small is a little bit different. There's always room for growth. And sometimes it starts just because you have to let go and you have to invest and you have to try with saying, I'm not going to hide this anymore. 
I'm going to make it work. I'm going to take care of the small that I have. Sometimes it starts with family. Yeah. That's the small in a lot of houses around here. They're small, yeah. Well, when they get bigger, we'll start. Take care of the small. Some of the greatest Christian leaders in the future are still babies. And they're sitting in your house. And it's going to be so amazing what you're able to do with them. Take that family challenge. Goodness. It's going to be great what you see in your child as they grow. The bottom line of all of this is, you know, you have to be part of the kingdom. Because unless you enter into that kingdom, you, you don't get in with this. You need to be part of that kingdom. Salvation starts there. And he talks about being born of the water and the spirit. Those people who are baptized into Christ are immersed into the water and his spirit. And so they're made clean and new and they start. And that's the small, that's where it just first begins. And then they start doing something with their faith. But you have to start there. Did you know that I could have gone to the space station? We lived in Titusville, Florida. And six miles across the inlet was the space shuttle. We lived there for 13 years. I should have gone and gotten on one, right? And so I went and I watched almost every launch of everything. It could have happened, right? There's only one small problem. I was not an astronaut. If you're not an astronaut, you don't get to ride. If you're not a Christian, you don't get to ride. It matters who you are. I waited for 13 years for them to call me and say, okay, it's your turn to ride on the shuttle. Never got the call. We want to hear the call of God. You have to have that first. Deal with the small stuff. It's a small thing. Get it taken care of. Do it today. Would you come while we stand and sing?